So welcome everyone to the Virginia Farm to School Toolkit webinar series. This is a collaboration of Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Virginia Department of Education School Nutrition Programs. My name is Lena Wen. I'm an extension agent with Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm housed in Culpeper County. Um, this webinar series is designed to support and explain each chapter of the Virginia Farm to School Toolkit, which was developed to guide VCE extension agents, school division administrators, school nutrition professionals, educators, school garden coordinators, and others toward using farm to school practices as a means to increase equitable access to fresh, healthy Virginia grown food while providing hands-on learning opportunities in a variety of educational settings. Today's webinar is entitled Procuring Local Foods for Schools and Child Nutrition Programs. Planning menus around purchasing, preparing, and serving local food is the foundation for strong farm to school programs. Today, we are excited to be joined by three panelists who have navigated through the various challenges associated with procuring local food for schools and child nutrition programs. Jenny Jeffries is the supervisor of nutritional services for Page County Public Schools. Brittany Woodby is the Regional Sales and Marketing Manager for Appalachian Sustainable Development. And last but not least, Joanne Jones is the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Charlotte County, Virginia. Thank you all so much for sharing your expertise with us today. So Jenny is going to start us off by sharing what procurement of local food looks like in Page County schools. Then Brittany will tell us about lessons learned in their work with procuring local foods for local school systems. And finally, Joanne will tell us about a farm tour that she hosted for school nutrition directors. We will then open the rest of the webinar for your questions. And as our panelists share, we would encourage you to add any questions to the chat box so we can have our panelists share their perspectives once they present their slides. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Jenny. Thank you, Lena. Um, I started by giving you a map of Virginia and showing you where Page County is actually located. Um, we are a rural county in the northern Shenandoah Valley, actually in um, the Page Valley. Um, and so we are, uh, our east and west are both um, have mountains. And so we have a very unique uh, situation in terms of where we live. Next slide, please. So with Page County and our farm to school program, we do use a variety of procurement methods, um, but we actually prefer to go through a more formalized request for proposal process. Um, it is a sealed proposal process and can on the initial look very laborious and daunting. Um, it's typically the actual packet for that request for proposal is somewhere between 30 to 35 pages long. Most of it is typical um, required government language, um, but we end up choosing to use that process um, because it allows a school division to consider other factors rather than just the lowest cost um, put down by the person creating the proposal. Um, we also are allowed to use some additional factors um, that each division determines and we include in our RFP. So on the next slide, I can show you that in our uh, current version of our request for proposal for fresh produce, um, we do consider cost. Um, that is cost after considering geographic preference, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also consider the ability of a vendor to deliver to us, to meet our specifications, obviously their customer service. Um, we also factor in the timeliness of delivery from harvest. So again, that kind of hones into a more local person uh, will most likely be able to harvest and deliver quicker uh, than produce coming from another state, uh, especially say the West Coast. Uh, we also give preferential treatment to those who are willing to do education and engagement. And that can be the willingness to have our students go 
to the farm for a farm tour or the willingness for a farmer to come to our school division and speak with students. Uh, we also look at references and a history of sales to Page County Public Schools. Those, again, those three that are in bold though, uh, again, really allow us to kind of dive down and hopefully be able to get uh, more local produce. Uh, and that is specifically because we're using that formal request for proposal or RFP process. Next slide. So you may wonder what does local mean? Well, um, the government has determined that each school division can determine their own definition of the word local. In Page County, we have considered that a local item is one of two things. It's either grown within 100 miles of Page County. Um, so I have a diagram there that shows a 100 degree, uh, 100 mile radius from the center of Page County. And if you see, that includes uh, parts of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, the District of Columbia, uh, along with a large portion of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But because we are Virginia, we have additionally said you can either be grown within 100 miles of our county, or if it is grown anywhere within the Commonwealth of Virginia, we also consider it to be local. So we are that is our definition. And again, each division would come up with their own definition of local. So why does the definition of local matter? Next slide. So the government allows in an RFP process to use something called uh, geographic preference. And geographic preference is a price percentage preference that is used solely in the evaluation of that RFP. So we said cost is something that we factor in uh, our determination of who may get um, awarded uh, a particular item. Um, but this geographic preference allows us to drill down to really hopefully encourage the um, use of local produce. And here in Page County, our geographic preference, again, determined by each school division, but in Page County, we have said that we will give a 10% uh, preference to items that are grown within our county a 5% preference to those grown within a 100 mile radius of Page County. And as you recall, that includes parts of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and uh, the District of Columbia. And then if it's grown within the Commonwealth of Virginia, but outside of that 100 mile radius, we give a 3% preference. So I tried to give you um, just a, a what exactly that means in a sample. So if you imagine that produce A, B, C, and D are all the same produce, um, whatever it is, um, but it's just grown in different places. So if we have produce A, which was grown in North Carolina, and they, in the proposal price, said $4 a pound, um, that is not considered local to us in any of those three categories above. So when we're comparing, we are going to use that that price is $4 a pound. Um, if we had produce that same item, but it was grown on the eastern shore of Virginia, so, so somewhere within the Commonwealth, but outside of our 100 mile radius, um, if they proposed the price of $4.12 a pound, when we take the 3% off, that also, for comparison purposes, would have them at $4 something, uh, same item grown in Washington, D.C. in the District of Columbia within our 100 mile radius. Um, they could propose in the proposal $4.21 and we would compare it as if it were a bid of $4. And lastly, something grown within the county, uh, if they put in that they wanted $4.44 per pound for comparison, we would be at $4. So all of those items for the cost part of the comparison are there at that $4 level. What's important to know is, is that that truly is for comparison. So if we um, actually were to award to the Page County grown um, farmer, 
the farmer would still get their $4.44 a pound that they um, put in the proposal. So again, it doesn't change what we pay the farmer, it just changes how we determine what is the cheapest item. And so um, for us, that request for a proposal, using the definition of our local and geographic preference, again, hopefully uh, makes it easier for us to um, be awarding our um, contracts to those growers that are local uh, with our pinpoint being Page County, then we go out from that 100 mile radius or within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and I would encourage if there's anyone who has additional questions about uh, the RFP process, um, whether you are somebody wanting to sell to a division or uh, you're a division interested in this, uh, please don't hesitate to ask additional questions um, or reach out to me after uh, today or after viewing this webinar. I thank you again for having me and I will pass it on to Brittany uh, so she can share her information today. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so I'm coming to you all today to talk about the farmer side of what farm to school means and what we have experienced over the past few years of doing local procurement for cafeteria purchases for our schools. Um, so a little bit about who we are. We are slightly different than your average grower. Um, we are a collection of growers um, that aggregate products at a food hub and then disperse out into other markets. Um, and other markets in Southwest Virginia for us does include the school systems. So what we've learned over the past few years of doing local school is that we have very clear objectives um, for challenges that we face in rural communities um, within Southwest Virginia. And I think that it kind of, you'll see this kind of moving forward as a um, as a pulse for what kind of is going on within the within Virginia or within what you consider local, um, even if that means other states as well. So objective number one um, addresses seasonality extension and the variety expansion that's needed for school menus. So some of the challenges that we have come across is the regional climate. Um, specifically in Southwest Virginia, we have shorter growing seasons than let's say the Eastern shoreboard um, or other states that do surround us that still might fit within your local definition. Um, another challenge is that local farmers are very used to the specific crops that they have grown for generations or years um, prior to kind of stepping foot into the school um, market. And so those crops are can be typically monocrops that are not, di not diversified um, that meets specific nutritional guidelines or standards that cafeterias need to have on their plates. Um, so some of those things that we have or that we're working on with implementing within our farmer, uh, within the farmers that we work with, um, are expanding the farmer network to not just include those farmers within Southwest Virginia, but also incorporating farmers within adjacent states such as Kentucky, West Virginia, and North Carolina. Their growing patterns are a little different, so they can kind of offer season extension um, whenever the county that you're specific in might not have. Um, food available. It also means that we're being able to provide a variety of different produce that might not be grown in your local area. A lot of those are fruits. Fruits typically do not come from Southwest Virginia unless it's strawberry season. And unfortunately, the height of strawberry season is when school is not in session. Um, so really working with the network that's out there and that's available um, can really be a strong um, hold strong purchasing power within your all school systems. Um, we also utilize agricultural resources in the area in forms of grants um, and other funds, getting them small interest loans um, to be able to offer high tunnels so that cold weather crops in the off season um, and those season extension 
practices are available to farmers. Um, it is something that is very high cost to farmers. And um, sometimes they do need to see a little bit more of the um, purchase power behind the school systems themselves in order to take that next step. Um, and then also it's a lot of training and ag um, in ag education with those farmers, especially if a farmer hasn't been used to growing in high tunnels. Um, it's still the basic same principles, but there are a lot of different tweaks that they need to do. So they have to educate themselves as well. And what we have found is that farmers are willing and they want to do that because they want to provide um, season extension and or variety within the school systems. It's getting there. Um, and again, it's just kind of changing how they do business. So it's a tweaking their business model a little. So kind of think of it in that pathway. Um, typically a farmer's not going to tell you no, hard no. <laughs> um, they want to help. They, you know, their passion is their community and those schools. Um, so sometimes it's just working with them and understanding that it might not be this growing season, it might be the next um, as they kind of get up to speed with your needs. Um, also, we here at Appalachian Sustainable Development at our food hub do offer mentoring and education to farmers, not only on new crops that might be something that they've never grown before, um, such as yellow green vegetables um, that the schools are requesting or possibly putting in fruit bushes um, to help with the expansion of the variety of those particular crops so that you have more to offer on the menu and you're not just held to squash and tomatoes and lettuces. Um, so we help educate with that. Also, I think one of the things that we have uncovered recently is that not every farmer needs to be fully GAP FISMA certified to be able to participate with schools. And I think that that is something that um, needs to be heavily communicated on your end with your farmers of what your school district's needs are as far as food safety plan. Um, there are a variety of food hubs such as ourselves that can work with those farmers um, to get them to the point where their food safety standards meet yours um, to have on file. Um, so a lot of just that educating um, on the farmers and themselves, because um, they're out there, they're wanting to work with you guys. Um, and sometimes it's just making those connections as well. Next slide. So objective number two was to increase route footprint. Um, so I hate using the crutch that we're in rural Virginia and the mountains are very extremely hard to get around. However, one of the challenges that we do face as an aggregation delivery or logistics company um, is the mountainous terrain. Um, it takes a lot longer to get around the mountains than it does if you were in a more of a city urban area. Um, so some of those challenges that we have come across over the past few years is the rising cost of fuel, the lack of available CDL drivers um, during and after the pandemic has become problemsome. Um, and then limited route expansion due to the number of fleet vehicles specifically for us and then also for our farmers as well. Um, a lot of farmers that are doing direct um, to cafeteria deliveries there, it's one truck, it's one person. Um, so finding solutions to some of these problems. Um, we are focusing on being more deliberate with delivery stops in each county. Um, so that might mean that in a rural county, we're doing every other week for fresh local foods um, so that we can hit all of the counties and be a little bit more equitable to um, their menu planning. Um, we also are working with school divisions to have one or two sites, um, high schools or larger scale elementary schools to aggregate orders there, and then working with them to create a process to distribute out to the other schools from that particular one drop um, in that particular city or that particular community. Um, then also we're continually running route feasibility to analyze and fill the gaps that have been identified. Um, and some of those have led to other adjacent work within the communities. Um, one of those is the workforce development program that we currently have that typically teaches um, people with barriers to the workforce, um, providing them on the on the job paid training um, to learn about ag um, 
and get their feet wet there. But we also realized that CDL pathway was something that our participants were very much interested in. And then it fed right back into our particular need for CDL drivers to get our trucks on the road so that we can do deliveries um, to additional schools. Um, so we've actually had two participants come through that particular pathway who have been hired full time by our particular food hub in order to meet that particular need. Also, securing funding for fleet expansion was another big one to increase our route footprint. Um, so now instead of one box truck that is hitting schools Tuesdays and Mondays and Tuesdays, we now have two that will be doing the same so that we can increase our footprint within the counties and provide more product on the front end of the week, um, as we know that that is just more beneficial for a lot of our cafeteria staff um, to be able to utilize and prepare for that week's menu. Next slide. So third um, objective was compromise in communication. Um, and what we learned that it's not always cut and dry. We do take tiny baby steps, but that's okay. Um, and part of that is compromise um, on both ends. Um, the nutrition directors, when they want local, we have noticed that they step up to the plate and they really do work with us um, on a variety of different things, whether that's pricing, whether that's delivery timelines, whether that's even variety. Um, so creating out of the box solutions for both the farmers and the school nutrition staff so that it is a true win-win um, on everybody's side. It takes time, it takes a lot of communication um, and just understanding that we're all in the same community and we all just want things better for our kids um, and the local economic impact of the schools purchasing farmer produce. Also being understanding that one step leads to creating a path on a large scale. Um, and I think this is important because whether, wherever you are in your local um, procurement process, understand that one step forward makes a huge impact. And it really paves the way for building on that year after year or month after month or one crop at a time, um, or maybe it's a cluster of schools at a time. Um, as we would all like to have all the schools have all of the local things all at once, it's just sometimes not feasible. So really being understanding around that one step truly does lead to more. Um, and it sometimes it only takes that one step to get the ball rolling. Um, review internal processes and see how those can be updated to better serve school districts. This is something that we've um, been learning and reviewing and the more understanding that your farmer has about your process helps drastically make changes easier. Um, it helps with the communication and it helps with that communi that compromise um, because you all are the experts in what you do. The farmer is the expert in what they do. And they really do kind of need to understand um, the processes of how you want your offers to come in, when you need those orders delivered. Um, so that'll help with the compromise process as well. Um, on the communication side, um, just be consistent, um, be realistic. Um, I know farmers do tend to um, say, we're going to have something next week and then something happens like a hard frost and they can't get it to you until the following week. Um, so being realistic um, on the farmer's end is key. Um, do not overpromise and underdeliver, deliver. Um, and then also be transparent. When there is an issue um, on either side, whether it is a delivery that may not be the quality that you had anticipated, or there's more seconds than you know, first pick um, grading wise, let your farmer know. Um, they'll appreciate that and they will try to make changes to accommodate. Um, and on the flip side, if a farmer knows ahead of time that something's going to happen, um, make sure that you're communicating that with your nutrition directors. Um, while they can readjust and replan, they still need to have enough heads up to be able to do so that it's not a burden to be working with a farmer versus a larger ven vendor who can get product from California at a drop of a hat. Um, so be 
as transparent as possible so that that communication and that compromise can continue. Um, and remember that each district, each nutrition director, each cafeteria staff manager has different needs and will be different across the board. Um, just like they are allowed to define what local means to that particular district, their processes, their procedures, how they work within each of those school districts at the nutrition staff level is different. So accommodate and compromise um, to work with what their needs are best. That is all that I have today on the farmer side. So I will pass it off to Joanne. All right, good afternoon. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about a farm to school bus tour that we did in Charlotte County. And so I, similar to Brittany, work with a, with a food hub. It's called the South South Virginia Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. And here again, it's a way for pr producers to come together and they reach larger buyers and more markets as a, as a uniform group than they would individually. And so when they were looking at selling farm to school, one of the hurdles was how do they do that? How do they make the connections? Um, and how do they get the schools to trust them in the product without everyone being GAP certified? All right, if you'll move to the next slide. All right, so the purpose of the association is to promote improvements in the business of commercial vegetable and fruit growers and to promote better public relations and to develop fellowships and to serve its constituents in every reasonable manner. All right. You go to the next slide. All right, so when we first started looking at this, we wanted to figure out a way to connect the producers to the, to the schools and to, and to build that relationship. And so we partnered with Virginia State University and they actually had a bus that they brought down, which allowed us to not just meet in one area, but actually to take the school directors um, out to the farms and let them meet the producers and actually see how the, the, the products were being grown and packaged and prepared to come to the schools. And so that was just a way for us to let the directors of food services see exactly what was happening on each of the farms. So we, we met in Charlotte Courthouse at the Farm Bureau building in the basement. And um, we probably talked for about an hour there about what, what the producers could bring to the table with products, we tried to get a timeline from the schools as to when they want product because that was one of the big concerns within this hub was that a lot of the things that are grown are during the summer, not during the school year. Um, and so we kind of branched out a little bit later as this relationship developed with 4P, but I'll get into more of that in a few minutes. And so we met there and we, we discussed those things and, and did introductions. And then we loaded up on the bus, the bus that um, Virginia State University provided and we were able to go out to different farms and see the different commodities and the, um, the school nutrition directors were able to ask questions to see how things were packaged. We looked at farms that are GAP certified as well as farms that are not because a lot of the schools don't require that. Um, I will say that everybody within our food hub is required to go through a food safety training. That's part of the food hubs um, initiative to make sure we're supplying good clean product. Um, and then after that, we came back to the to the Farm Bureau building there, and they had a lunch that was prepared by Wanda Johnson. She also works with um, Virginia State University. It was a lot of um, interesting things on the menu, such as uh, kale salad, sweet potato bread. She made a punch. But all the things that were made were recipes and products that these producers made. They did purchase some fried chicken to go along with it to have some extra protein, but that was a good way for the school directors to see some different recipes that could be used to put things such as kale in a um, form that's more desirable to the children. Of course, now that opens the window of the schools having enough staff to prepare and cook and not all the schools can do that. So that's one of the things that we did um, glean from this product that working with different school districts there are different products they can handle and, and things they can't handle. Some of them prefer more um, packaged and ready to go things and others are able to process squash and things like that and cook them and, and get them in a form for the children to eat. All right, if you'll go to the next slide. So this is one of the farms we actually toured that day. This is Goldman Farms with Brick Goldman. And you can see his cabbage and some of the different things he had growing there. But this is what, the, what we were able to take them out and show them. And I really felt like it made a bond between the producers and the um, 
directors from those schools. And, and it just, it was, it was really a unique experience to, to be able to see their opinion and then the producers to get to meet them and just hear the different things that came out of that situation by being able to take them out to the farms. We have not been able to do that and take children out of the farms, but I think that would be another really unique experience. All right, if you'll move on to the next slide. So from this, our hub was able to connect with several of the surrounding counties and they began a partnership and selling product to those schools. COVID did slow things down because we did our um, bus tour the year prior to COVID and things had started picking up and we were selling to Cumberland, Prince Edward, Mecklenburg was one of our star players with Robin Moore. Um, but with COVID things slowed down, they've picked back up some. And I will say along with this, we also went into the schools. We did um, demos where we brought in different products and had you know, we brought in labor to help slice and dice and get the products in a sampling type form in little cups. The, the children came through the cafeteria. They were able to sample things. It was unique to hear the kids say something as simple as a cantaloupe. Some of them never had that before. And just to see if they enjoyed that or didn't. We also had the farmers actually come in and bring product and seeds. And they, um, they talk to the kids about how long it takes things to grow, about the planting process, the harvesting process, and what that looks like. Um, and then we, from that, we started working with 4P out of Charlottesville. It become, we have one reefer truck at our food hub, and it's really hard with the deliveries they were already making for their markets for them to make runs to the schools, especially like a school district like Mecklenburg, it, was, it wasn't one stop, you were going to five different schools. And so our group decided it's easier for us to, to grow and to sell than it is to deliver. And so they, we've kind of partnered with 4P and they're doing the delivery and we're doing the growing. And that's been a really good relationship and it still enables them to, to be able to do the farm to school. Um, and then something we're, we're currently working on, and this has just started coming up is a backpack program. And that's, it's a, it's a nutrition program through some of the local schools and the kids will actually get a backpack that has fresh product in it and not just um, processed foods, which is really unique. But we've got some logistics to work through here with which products will work. Um, we kind of talked about this before we started this Zoom session. And, um, you know, if it's a child at home with not a lot of adult supervision, you know, a squash or cabbage may be something they can't, they don't have the knowledge base to be able to process and get into a ready to eat format. So it may be more of our fruit, of more of our like carrots or watermelon, things that are, that are easier, things that are pre-packaged a little bit that would go into these backpack programs. But that's something we're, we're looking at as a, as an alternative moving forward. All right, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, and then with, with that, I would just say that that was a really great experience. It definitely enabled our food hub to reach out to different school divisions in our area and have them to come in and see what we can grow. And it built trust and relationships. And so if you have any questions moving forward or if you think you want to put together a bus tour like this, I'd be willing to work with you to give you contacts for like Wanda, who did a fabulous job putting together the meal and working with our local producers with what they had in season. And then, you know, if you're any, any of the divisions, I think you could get buses even through the school. But Virginia State was a great partner for us with that resource when we did our bus tour. But so my contact is here if I can help in any way. And uh, I'll turn it over to Lena next. Thank you all. I think you all have um, provided a really um, interesting perspective from all around the state about some really cool initiatives that you all are doing to make sure that our kids are experiencing more local foods in their school lunches. Um, so we will open it up to questions now if anyone has any, and we're not that big of a group, so I would encourage you to just unmute and ask those questions if you have one. All right. Well, Jenny, Brittany, Joanne, after you all have heard from each other, do you all have any final um, tips for folks to get started with farm to school stuff? I think Brittany said it best in that um, whether you're a farmer or a school division, um, any step is a good step. And so if you're a farmer, 
and you might be able to, you know, uh, do one product and maybe not as much as an entire, the entire division, but that we're possibly, you know, you can do one product that can be used in one school. That's fantastic. One product that can be highlighted in one school meal. Great. If you're a school division, you know, again, baby steps. If you can work and do this at one school one time, that's fantastic. It It is just little by little. You don't need to feel like you need to jump all in all at once. Um, and I did not uh, put my contact information in there, but uh, if you look up Page County Public Schools, um, you can find my contact information on our website. Awesome. Thank you. Jenny, I think I heard you share at another conference your experience of using radishes from a school garden in salads. And even though it was just one little tiny slice of radish that each kid's got, it was it was a good first step. So, um, you know, I think I think we could all, you know, find an easy first step like that for us to get started. Um so Nikki asked if we can receive a copy of the slides. So this is actually being recorded and Stuart is um, editing these videos and they will be posted on the website that I just um, dropped into the chat. And that is also where you can register for future webinar um, webinars within this series. So um, thank you all so much for your time today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week.